it's so great to be able to have those performances. It kind of reminds me of when we had Sarah Ada come and the whole service was just music. I wish I could just say, okay, you guys could just go home now. <laughs> that would have been nice. So today I am finishing our series, a Christmas series that we've been doing for the last a month or so. And the series we, we decided to call Beyond Belief Becoming because basically the whole series we've just been talking about the value of not just having beliefs or believing in God, believing in Jesus, believing in truth, um, believing in the divine principle or whatever we want to believe in, but the necessity of going beyond believing into becoming, embodying God's word in our life, in the way we think, in the words that we speak, and the way that we live. So today I'm going to be talking about loving God. So in the Bible, there's a story about how God, how Jesus was having a debate with some uh, Jewish scholars. And uh, somebody came up to him and said, you know, Jesus, so there's all these commandments, right? There's all these um, commandments in the Jewish law. There's 613 of them. What is the most important out of all these commandments? And so Jesus said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. So I, uh, I want to talk about that a little bit today as, the me as a, kind of the focus of the message. I found that when I'm talking with people um, about their faith or their belief in God or Jesus, a lot of people fall into one of two mindsets about, about what I just read. There's the group of people that focus a lot on the belief and loving God and obeying the commandments, reading God's word. Essentially kind of having, having faith and practicing that faith in that way. But then sometimes in this camp of people, you find a lot of people who focus so much on the faith or what we would call like the vertical relationship with God that we neglect uh, our horizontal relationships or, or kind of what I guess maybe a, a better way of saying it, like caring about other people. And uh, I'm not even just talking about people on the street, you know, who are, you know, homeless or suffering uh, without food. I'm talking about like even people in our own families, you know. We have some differences, uh, or maybe this person hurt me, or that person hurt me, or whatever, and it's, we can't get along. We can't forgive one another. Or it might be people in our church family that, you know, we, we learn from God's word about the importance of repentance. We learn about the importance of reconciliation and forgiveness, but many times we're not even able to extend that to our own church brothers and sisters. So... And people see that and they're like, well, you know, that's, that's great that you love God so much, but don't we need to also practice that with our brothers and sisters as well? And then uh, I find another kind of group of people, um, and I, I don't mean to generalize, but this has just been kind of my experience, uh, that uh, people focus on the second commandment, the second one, which is to love your neighbor. And a lot of people focus on you know, caring for others, the social needs, the people who, are, who don't have um, even the, the basics to survive. And there's a lot of focus in this area of like giving to charity, caring for people, um, it, regardless of what you believe, regardless of what you think. But then oftentimes in this area, in this group, you'll find that the idea of loving God, of, of, of a relationship with a real God, is not always quite there. The hope is that if we love people, we are loving God at the same time, which, is, which I believe is true. But at the same time, loving God is also a very intentional mindset and way of living as well, that we can't ignore 
So I think that finding a balance between the two is really, really important. Tend, we tend to focus on one or the other, I think oftentimes because we have people in our life who are so strong one way or the other, and we tend to go the opposite direction. This is kind of what happens a lot. In reflecting in, on this in my own life, I've been thinking about this particular point. These last five years that Adonia and I have been in Colorado, I think that we've tried to do both. I think that we've tried to invest into like a vertical relationship of loving God and seeking what is God's will for my life and our community. And I think that we've also tried to, in our horizontal relationship, care for one another and our members and seek for where reconciliation is possible and forgiveness and um, promote that as important in our community. But to be honest, when I look back on the last five years, I think that if I had to pick one of the two that we've kind of, especially for myself, like focused on and, and uh, promoted more, it would be the second one. It would be love thy neighbor. And we focus so much energy and attention on hosting families and, and spending time with people, especially people who are in need. And there have been many times where I feel like I have neglected the first one, loving God. What did he say? Loving God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. So when I look at the life of Jesus that we know about, which is actually fairly little in the Bible, uh, one of the things that really sticks out to me is that Jesus was really a person who, first and foremost, he loved God. Everything that he did in his life, from teaching people to sacrificing, serving others, healing the sick, serving the poor, all these different things that Jesus did in his life, I think that Jesus was a compassionate person, just like all of us are when we see somebody in need. But I think that first and foremost, Jesus could live the way he lived because the first thing was that he loved God. He loved God. That was the most important thing to him. Because he loved God, he loved people. And I think that the reality is we think that loving people is an easy thing sometimes. It's not a big deal. You know, we can go and you know, serve at a pantry or homeless shelter, give, give to people when they ask. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but in the last five years we've been here, it's been kind of a, a mix. It's been a very interesting experience to live here in the parsonage and have the phone number connected with the church's number. Because whenever somebody calls or they're looking for something, they'll either knock on our door or they'll call my phone. And that's led to a lot of very interesting experiences. Um, I, just to name a few, I had um, a guy um, who I'm pretty sure was homeless knock on our door at like 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking. I opened the door and he's like, I need, I need a ride to... Um, what do you call it, uh, like a, a center for alcoholics, like a, I don't know what you call it, rehabilitation, a rehabilitation center. And I'm like, you know what, I don't know if they're open at 2 o'clock in the morning, but I also don't know what to do with this guy. So I went ahead and gave him a ride to this, uh, this building, and the place looked completely closed and empty, and all the lights were off. But he's like, yeah, this is it, let me out. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Just, I don't know what else to do, so I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I wish for the best, you know, and, and I've, had, I've had several experiences like that, uh, people asking for money for a hotel room, uh, people uh, needing this help and that help, and it's, um, it's been a really great experience in some ways, but at the same time, I've had the experience where people ask for help, and then they don't really express any gratitude, or, or they might call you back later, asking for more help, and you're like, I don't know if this person really needs help or if they're just um, exploiting me. And then, then you kind of have the worst experiences where like, people are threatening you and things like that. 
And it's like a mixed bag. And, and I kind of realized that that's kind of the thing with, with helping people, is that you, you can have the best intentions, but you can't really control what other people are going to do. And some people will be really grateful for your help, and some people will let you down. Some people will resent it. And you can't, you know, you can't control, and people come, and people go, and people are in your life, and people are out of your life. And it can be kind of painful sometimes. I think Jesus had that experience well, as well. Look at how many people he tried to, to teach. How many people he, he, he loved, and he healed, and he taught, and he, and he served, and he, he lived his life for God, and he lived his life for people. But what did he have to show for it at the end of the day? The people turned their back on him. You know, oh, he would say something that would challenge them, right? Like, he, I remember, uh, I, I think I mentioned this the last sermon as well, but, you know, at one point he said something that was very challenging to people. He said, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood, right? That's where we get communion from, right? And, and then the people were like, uh, I don't know what to say about that. You know, and people are taking him literally. And then, and then it says in the Bible that a lot of his followers left him at that time. And then at the end, even though he had done nothing but, I, I, I mean, I don't know. Maybe in, maybe in the Bible it doesn't include the things that he did that were uh, too hard for people to digest. I don't know. But it seemed like he really tried to care for people. But at the end of the day, the, uh, the, uh, the people had the opportunity to let him free. You know, but they chose, to, um, they chose not to do that. And they turned his back on him. And even those, his own followers were nowhere to be seen when he went to the cross. And one of his own followers betrayed him. So I, I would think that it would be kind of easy in that kind of a situation to really feel resentful, you know, for having cared for people and tried to serve people and uh, living the life that Jesus had led. And I think that that is often the way that life is for us. You know, I think that we all have the natural intention to be good and to care for other people and to help another person when they're down. But, I, but sometimes this desire to give, we can lose sight of it. We get hurt, we get disappointed, not enough gratitude, and it, doesn't bec it, it changes from having this desire to give unconditionally to feeling like, well, when am I going to get returned? What, when am I going to get my just rewards? <laughs> you owe me, or the world owes me, or the church owes me, or something, you know? We can lose sight of this grateful giving, and it becomes giving based off of, of a condition, just giving with, a, with the expectation that I'm going to get something in return. So we need to watch out for that. You know, I, I tried to think, you know, Jesus living his life, and, and of course many, pe many good people who have lived a, a virtuous life, they've given, gave, gave so much. And I kind of think, well, what do they stand to gain? You know, what did Jesus stand to gain from living the way he lived? And it wasn't like people always accepted what he had to say as well. Sometimes people, you know, uh, couldn't, didn't want to listen to him, or they would spread rumors about him, all these different things. He wasn't just accepted because he was trying to do good. So ultimately, I think that the thing that allowed Jesus, even though Jesus said that there's two commandments, there's two great commandments, love God and then love people, I believe that there was a reason that there was said in that order. I think that you know, we can love people, we can love our brothers and sisters, but our own perspective really gets in the way. Over time, we get hurt. We lose faith in humanity. We lose faith in people, even if our own, our own uh, flesh and blood. And like I said, people aren't always going to, you know, return your, your good, well-meaning gestures. I think that the thing that allowed Jesus to live his life the way he did, and even up to the end, 
Even when God forsake him on the cross and all of his followers turned his back on him and all of his disciples turned their back on him and one of them even just turned him in for some money, Jesus could still maintain a grateful heart because he wasn't doing it. At the end of the day, he wasn't doing it for those people. He was doing it for God. He was loving God first and foremost. Even when all the people forsook him, he could still love them. He could still forgive them. And even when God forsook him, he could still be faithful to God. He could still be the faithful son. Very special person. Jesus also had to say this. He said, the poor you will always have with you, and you can help them anytime you want, but you will not always have me. So most of you know that when I was younger, I did a missions program. We called it STF at the time. And uh, this was like a gap year, one or two years after high school, before college. And at that time, it was very, very simple. You go out and we sell pictures, wind chimes, jewelry to make money for our missions program. <laughs> it's basically all we did. And uh, it, was, it was a challenge every day to get out of bed, or in our case, the van. And and just get up and go out the door. Whether it was raining or snowing or windy or too hot or whatever, it didn't matter. This was our opportunity to challenge myself to... The thing that I really valued about it is that I was always hitting a limit of how much I really uh, was willing to invest into my own life of faith and caring for other people. I was getting into arguments with other people in the van or struggling with my team leader, struggling to want to go out and meet another person. Some people, they're like, oh, yeah, show me what you're doing. I'm so interested. Let me give you some money. You know, I want to support what you're doing. I love young people getting out there and doing something positive. But then there's a lot of people who are, you know, they'll just shut the door in your face. They get out of my property. No soliciting, you know. And, you know, you had a lot of that, and it was, it was many times challenging to, you know, get back on your feet and, 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 and uh, you know, go to the next place. Many times it was tempting just to take a lot, 40, 50-minute bathroom break or something like that, you know? But at one point in the program, I became kind of like a mentor for the newcomers, lack of a better word. And... So we would go out together, me and another person. And my role was to kind of be there for that person, to um, support them, to guide them, teach them the, the tricks and the tips, you know, I guess what we call now the life hacks of fundraising. Um, and I really struggled with that. I struggled with that more than the actual fundraising. You know why? Because that person slowed me down. <laughs> Not that I was very good anyway. I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> but it was like the difference between making like $50 and like making $150, right? You know, it was a big deal for me. Um, but I would, uh, I would get frustrated because I'm here with this new person. They don't really know what to say or what to do. They're kind of slow. Maybe they're like dragging their feet a little bit. And, uh, you know, I would be in the habit of trying to move quickly and get to the next person as fast as possible. And, you know, we'd have to take turns. He would, we would approach somebody and he would say his spiel and then I would, we would approach the next person and I would say my spiel. So we take turns, which basically, by definition, means that you can only make half as much money. <laughs> um, but then I also just struggled with, um, uh, why is he saying that? Why is he doing things that way? And just being really kind of critical and, and frustrated but then I, um, then I decided just to take a step back and I asked myself, you know, well, why am I here? Does it really matter that if I'm going to be making $50 or $150, I'm not keeping any of the money anyway, but, you know, what, does it really matter? Does it really matter? Why am I here? This is my second year of the program. And I just decided to chill out, first of all, but then also to recognize and to ask God, you know, why... What do you see in this person that you want me to see? 
how can I support this person the way you would want me to support them? And my whole mindset just shifted. Because it wasn't about me and going around with some dead weight, but it was about me being able to encourage and support another human being, another child of God, somebody who was in my shoes a year before then. What can I pass on to this person that's going to help them to have a successful year, to have a successful experience, to experience God? You know, we say we should experience God in other people, right? So it was an opportunity for me to allow this person to experience God through me, despite my limitations and small mindset. So I, from then on, tried to really encourage and support and not really care so much whether I really made money or not. And it, was, it became a really great experience. I'm not going to say that anything really changed, like I didn't start making a bunch of money, or like, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't like that, but the main point was what's more important to God? We make a few extra dollars so that I can really care and support this other person. And I, and I felt like caring and supporting this other person was more important. And, uh, you know, I don't know what their, I don't know what they remember from that experience, but that's an experience that I never really forgot. So, going back to the point that I was talking about before, about loving God, I think that there's something really valuable and important about that. Because what is the origin? What is the origin of everything in our life? What is the origin of everything that we have? Where does love even come from? Did it just appear because of evolution? I don't think so. I, I can understand that God guided, guided creation through a period of many, many uh, millions of years. I'm okay with that. But I don't think that love just showed up out of nowhere. I think that that's something we get, get directly from God. So then the question is, what does it mean to love God? Because lo God is not a person that I can, I can love. He's not right here in front of me. So then I think, well, the next best thing for me is how do I love people in my life? How do I love, what does it mean to love a person or to love something? You know, we throw around the word love very casually in American culture. But when we think about it, like, what does it really mean to love another person? What does it leave, mean to love my children? What does it mean to love my spouse? What does it leave, mean to love my parent, my mom or my dad? I think it comes down to two things. I think first, it means that your life, you live for that person. And I think that it also means that we put that person's needs before my own needs. I think that's what love is. We run into problems in our relationships when we put my needs first, right? When I put my, my opinions, the way I want things to be, my habits and attitudes before other people, we run into problems. A, healthy, a marriage can't work that way. A family can't work that way. And I think even a, a, a company, government, all these things that rely on relationships can't work that way. I, I believe that putting God first in our life since I mentioned it, it means caring for the things that God cares about. It means allowing myself to be used by God, to be useful to God. And that means becoming a godly person, recreating myself into be a person that resembles God's character and nature. It means caring for others, and it also means caring for nature. I have a quote here from Reverend Moon, our founder, that I thought was really great. He says, I became a completely different person when I began to love God. I loved humanity more than myself and was more concerned with the problems of others than the problems of my family. I loved everything that God created. I deeply loved the trees on the hills and the fish in the waters. My spiritual senses developed so I could discern God's handiwork and all things of creation.
I think it also means growing up in our understanding of God. Because it can be possible, I think, to love God, but it's, we're, we're loving our concept of who God is. Or we're loving what God has done for me, and then doesn't always translate into actually becoming a loving person, <laughs> or a caring person, or, or a person that actually exhibits those characteristics in their life. I think that's kind of a problem. I think it's also important that we, th- we consider really seriously. So, you know, I used to, I used to talk about this point that um, many people talk about, right? You probably heard it before. So people, somebody will say, you know, if, I, if I'm happy, then God is happy. If I do something that makes me happy, then God is happy with that. And I used to, I used to, I don't want to misspeak here. I still believe that, but I realize that's a very um, sm- kind of a, a childish understanding of God, of our relationship with God. It's not bad, but it's kind of like a child's perspective about our relationship with God. It's kind of like your parent is you know, looking at you, like my little four-year-old daughter today, <laughs> she would absolutely not wear a, a dress for church. The closest thing we could get, as you noticed, is a swimsuit with a tutu. She, she was adamant, like absolutely would not budge, and she's like this. She, if she decides something, she just will not budge on this thing. So we just had to let go of it, you know. We weren't going to ban her from church because she was wearing a swimsuit. Uh, <laughs> But very interesting. <laughs> um, why did I? Why did I bring that? Oh yeah. So so the so you know the, when the child is like that, it's like yeah you know you smile and it's like yeah I love you anyway right, and it's not a big deal right when the, when it's a child and the parent and the parent and the child is like yeah my parent is happy smiling you know and life goes on right and I think that many times we 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 look at God that way we're like you know God. You know, if, if I'm happy or if I'm doing something that makes me happy and God is smiling, then every, all is good. You know, I'm just going to live my life however way I want to live it. I think that part of the reason we need to read God's word is that we need to understand that that kind of understanding is not the kind of understanding that Jesus brought to us. It's a child's understanding. And it's a very conceptual understanding of who God is. Jesus wasn't content just to live his life and do his thing and and pray for God's blessing on his work. Jesus continually thought, what is your will? Your will be done. You know, of course he had his plans and his ideas, but he always sought for what was God's will in the moment. Even if it meant he had to go to the cross, he was okay with that because he loved God. His life was for God. It wasn't for any other reason, and it wasn't for people um, only. So I think that we need to take that to heart. I I, I feel like I need to take that to heart because I don't want to be the child that looks at the smiling parent he may have a smile on his face, but you can't see the pain in the eyes. You know what I'm talking about? You know how you can smile and you can act like your life is all okay, but actually inside you're suffering? Actually inside you're in pain? Because the thing that you really care about is it's, it's, not, it's not the way you want it to be? I think that's like God. I, th- I really do. I uh, might be wrong, but that's what I think. I think God, he does smile at us, you know, to see us together as a church family and to, with the songs and hearing the message and growing. I think that God, that makes God happy. And I think that when we're gardening or when we're in nature or we're doing different things that we enjoy, I do think that makes God happy. But I think that as children of God, we need to recognize that there's a more mature perspective and that we can't just be satisfied with God being happy with my happiness. That we have to look to see what is the father's, what is our parent's pain? What is, what is our parent 
What does our heavenly parent need from me? Not just some ethereal thing out there. What does God need from me in my life? Now, you know, we're not like Jesus or, you know, um, we're n- none of us are world leaders or things like that. But I, so we don't have to, you know, I don't think that anyone expects us to live the way Jesus did, per se. You know, to go out in the desert and fast for 40 days and to cry, um, pray with blood vessels bursting and, you know, going to the cross and all these things like that. But I do think that we need to take the seriously this idea of a real relationship with God, that God may need me for something. What could that be? And to seek for it. Every person's different. You know, it's going to be different for me than for Reverend Juan Tete or for James or for, you know, William. We don't know what that actually is going to look like in your life or in my life. But the question is, am I even trying to figure it out? Am I even, do I even care? That's the question. When we discover what it is that I can do for God that's meaningful to him, then I can embrace that. This is why God put me on this earth. This is why I am here today. We find meaning in our life, deep, deep meaning. Not just the meaning that I assign to it, but also God, what God wants for me too. And then we eventually we can bring those two things together. What I want for my life and what God wants for my life They should overlap. They should. They should be one and the same. And they should bring us joy. They should. That's something we need to work towards. You know, these days, it disheartens me to see the way people talk to each other about differences of ideology, beliefs, theology, maybe politics, very disappointing. What gives us the power to love people who think completely opposite from us, who maybe don't agree with us on the most fundamental things that we believe in or think are the most important? What gives us the power to love a person and to forgive a person who's wronged me in some serious way? Maybe you're just a really amazing person. (laughs) I think that for the rest of us, it really helps to connect with God's heart and love for people, God's love for his children. Asking God, you know, what do you see in this person? Surely God loves me equally to my brother or sister, even if we completely disagree on everything. Even if they're the worst person (laughs) in the world. You know how you can get that way sometimes when you dislike somebody and you just think this is the worst person in the world. Maybe it's your spouse, you know, something like that. <laughs> but these are, the, these are the people that are in our lives that we need to practice God's word on first and foremost before we talk about, you know, how other people should live their lives. So... This is something that I've been thinking about a lot, especially because this Ukrainian group came a couple weeks ago. And I've been really um, mulling that experience over in my mind because, as I mentioned two weeks ago, the, the thing that I gained from that experience is my, my need to grow as a person. And also my need to focus on God, first and foremost. I mentioned that Adonia and I, we, we, we've really focused on the second one, second commandment, right? Love your neighbor. I feel like that's what we've been trying to do. And not that we've been not trying to love God, but, but the thing that I took away from this is this. Let's look down the road, 30 or 40 or 50 years. Things are going to look a lot different then. Let's say, for example, you know, we go and we go and we go and we're serving people and we're trying to take care of people, and guiding and educating people. You can't control what people are going to do. Maybe we'll just get discouraged. Maybe we just get jaded. Maybe we just get disheartened. He told us, uh, Reverend Leader, Rev, uh, Reverend Chung, the national leader, he told us, there's many people I know who have tried to do what you're doing. What makes you think you're going to be successful? 
<laughs> I loved it. I love the honesty. I love the honesty. I re actually really appreciated it. Um, because he's like us. He was born into the church. He just happens to be like 50 years old. Um, but very interesting. Kind of the similar parallels in our life. He may be 50 now, but 20 years ago, he moved to Ukraine. Three young children, no money. Uh, well, I, I don't know if it's exactly the same, but we, I felt it was like very similar. In 20 years, I'm going to be kind of in his footsteps or his shoes. And, uh, but it really got me thinking about, yeah, you know, if we just keep going, but we don't focus on our, what we're doing it for, should be God, right? We just focus on people, how discouraging and disappointing might that be? <laughs> because although good things do happen when you invest into people, uh, bad things happen too. Uh, let's take the opposite scenario. Let's say 30, 40, 50 years down the road, we're just like killing it. You know, the church is so full that we have like four services or we're like built another addition onto the building or we have new building or we expand or whatever. And we're just, I mean, it's just there's so much love and uh, new members joining all the time. And uh, we got a whole culture around what we're doing, school, museum, gymnasium, a family center, maybe some apartments, all these things. Let's say 30, 40 years down the road, that's what that looks like. But you know what happens to people sometimes when they get successful? You get pride. You get prideful, right? You get arrogant. So I did this, you know? Yeah, I'm pretty good. <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah, God's in there somewhere, but it was my, it was, it was really me. You know, I, 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 uh, I was... It, if it wasn't for me, like, it just would never have happened. So yay for me, and, uh, you know, I deserve a lot of, uh, I deserve a lot of um, credit and, 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 for that matter, money and, uh, and recognition. I should be in the news, you know, because, of course. Uh, so obviously, that's not good either. And that may seem kind of funny, but actually it happens to people, doesn't it? Doesn't it happen to lots of people? So I really felt that um, this experience was kind of God elbowing me in the ribs a little bit, um, giving us a little nudge and saying, you know, I hear you. I see your intentions, your motivation, and I think I, this is what I felt. I think you're doing the right thing. But focus on me and my word. And if you do that, then... It will help us from not getting discouraged and will also help us from following the straight and narrow, not becoming prideful, not becoming arrogant because we're putting the credit where the credit is due. And it's not me. It's God and it's all of you. So I'm really trying to take that to heart in my life, really um, looking you know, when, we, when I give my Who Are We presentation, one of the things that I talk about is what, are we, what do we pledge to do for you, right? So we have a new person in the audience, and I say, what, what, is, what do I pledge to do for you? And one of the things is, as a church leadership, we say we're always going to be seeking for what God's will and desire is for our community. Not just my opinion about what we should be doing, but what does God want for us to do? And I feel like this is right in that sort of way of thinking. It's kind of funny because I still don't really know why the Ukrainian people came here. I don't know why it happened and I don't know how it happened. It just, it just kind of happened. One of the Ukrainian members messaged me one day and he's like, hey, we're gonna do a, is it okay if we do a workshop at the beginning of December? I'm like, yeah, sure. I have no idea, like at that time I had no idea like what it was about, national leader came and everything and then I realized oh he came just to talk with us but why like he hasn't even been to America in six years but somehow I really felt I really felt God's guiding hand I really feel that when we pray for God's guidance on our community that and it's really sincere and also we're willing to take the advice and even if it's kind of um, hard to accept that uh, God will work. And actually, what he had to say to us wasn't so easy to accept. We were having dinner together, and he was like, 
and he, he was basically telling us that, um, you know, you need to focus on God's word because I can tell you're not. <laughs> and I was like, oh, shoot. And, you know, a part of me could have just said, oh, well, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Crazy Korean guy. But actually, you know, when I really looked deep inside, I really felt like there was so much truth in what he was saying. And if I could digest it and in, bring it into what we're doing now, it's just going to make it what we're doing better. So I had nothing but grateful feelings about it. <laughs> but it could have been ugly. I mean, if I had been like, oh, you, you don't know what you're talking about, whatever. So I'm grateful that I could just shut up and listen. Um, anyway, although there's many lessons that we can potentially learn from Jesus' life, and this is our fifth year giving a, a, sermon, a Christmas sermon about Jesus, uh, this is the one that really resonates with me right now, to inherit Jesus' mindset about putting God first and loving God. So before I finish, I want to share a little bit about some things that we have coming up in the new year, because I, we're not going to be here next week. We're going to be out of town uh, visiting family. My dad's going to be giving the message, so make sure you come and, and show up, although I know like 30 people are going to be in New York for this rally, so um, it'll be okay. Um, but uh, it's, it's essentially the end of the year, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, last message that we're giving this year, uh, last message of the decade, essentially, new decade starting. And I just, you know, I don't, normally we spend some time talking about, you know, the year before, what happened this year and the coming year. And we're going to make a video. At least that's our, that's our plan. <laughs> don't know when we're going to make it, but we're going to make a video. And we want to share with you some of the things that have been happening the last in this last year, because so many things happened. But I also want to share some things about this coming year that I feel are very exciting and some things to look forward to that we're planning and uh, working out. So um, first of all, Adonia and I, we really took seriously this point of the Ukrainian team coming here. They asked us to come to Ukraine and learn firsthand from them what they're doing. And so we, Adonia and I actually committed already to going in April. We're going to be going from April 1st to 5th, and you're welcome to come with me, too, with us, if you want, you know? I think tickets are around eight or nine hundred dollars. But I hear Ukraine's very beautiful, so you could call it a vacation, although I'm pretty sure we're mostly going to be in a workshop. <laughs> but I'm really hoping that uh, through going there and inheriting from them where they've been successful, that we can learn some things that we can take to our community to help us as well. Because I don't believe in copy and pasting. It's a different culture, it's a different it's history, but there's things that we can inherit from them. Their community is just a little bit bigger than ours, but they have done a lot. Um, one of those things that they've done is they've made very successful businesses. They have eight of them, and plus a ninth one, which is an international business. It's called Loiverse. If you search point of sale systems on Google Play, it's number three, under Square or um, Clover, you know? It's like, it's a way of accepting credit card purchases, like what we do in the cafe. But it's theirs, they built it. <laughs> um, and they've got a, uh, like a Kona Coffee Cafe and a Panini Shop and all this cool stuff. That's very nice, I looked it up on Google Maps. Um, so it really got me thinking about, well, you know, a, a number of you who are more financially minded have told me over the years that uh, we should invest into making more money some way because you know uh you know it's um i mean i personally think that tithing is the lifeblood of a church it shows how much people are invested personally into it but you know earlier this year i was preparing the budgets for 2020 and i was asking the different ministry leaders hey what should we do uh, what do you want? What do you want to do? You want to do a workshop uh, with Sunday school, French ministry, uh, campus witnessing, family camp, um, you know, all these different things, right? That we're doing, and many even things that are kind of behind the scenes that we don't see. And I added it all together, and you know what happened? <laughs> What's that? We are short. Yes, we are short. Uh, so. I added, we added up the whole budget and it was about $20,000 short. And I was like, wow, okay, that's very enlightening. 
So we ended up making some cuts here and there, which is fine. I mean, that's life, right? You can't always do everything that you want to do. But it really got me thinking, oh, shoot, you know, I need to find ways to make more money. <laughs> So we started brainstorming. We, you know, of course, if you all decide that you want to increase your tithing, I think that's very good. I, I believe in it, you know. Um, but I'm also looking at other options. And uh, so one of those options is, you know, I was thinking, well, you know, it takes a lot of work and effort to start a business, you know, and, you know, it's, it's like all these things. I don't know how to do it. Uh, but what can we do with what we have now to, uh, to make money? And so one of the things that we're planning to do next year, and I know that some of you are not going to like this, but <laughs> one of the things that we're planning to do next year is that we're going to turn this chapel into a multi-use room. Uh, we're going to renovate the stage. Not the wood floor. The wood floor is nice, but the look and the... The pews are going to be replaced with chairs, and uh, we're going to put a sound, sound room back there, and we're going to have to invest in some good chairs, some tables that can be folded up and put away, and many, many different things that are going to be necessary in order for us to be able to rent this room out when we're not using it. This room is the least used room in our building. We use other rooms all the time whether it's the, the um, schooling programs happen during the week or people coming and listening to Divine Principle or different things like that, different events that happen throughout the week, the chapel does not get used that much. And until that changes, I want to utilize it to find ways to make more money. And uh, you know, renting it out for maybe another church that wants to meet during the week or, or maybe an art show or people just doing some kind of a conference or something like that. Um, that way it kind of can maybe alleviate some of the, some of the, um, the weight of trying to cover all of our expenses and all the things that we want to do on top of our expenses uh, with the tithing money. We also have some other plans, but not really ready to share those yet. But, and they're also a little bit more long term. But that's, that's something that we're working on. Um, we are putting the finishing touches on the video for headquarters. But regardless of whether they help us or not with the exterior renovation, we're going to get started next year. So that'll be fun. <laughs> a lot of work. And the only way we can do this in a way that we can afford is by having volunteers help, right? So if you have, so from time to time, we're going to be putting out some, some emails or some Facebook messages or whatever saying, hey, we need some help to uh, rip out this carpet and refinish the floor. Or we need some help to... Um, you know, put up some paneling on the wall, or we need some help to mount some TVs up here, something like that, or we need some help. And we also have lots of plans for the renovations around the rest of the building, too, because there's so many things that need to be done. The, the floor in the playroom downstairs is disgusting. The floor in the Sunday school room for the zero to four-year-olds is disgusting. Um, the office is disgusting. Um, I, I could just go on and on, you know, but like... <laughs> I don't want to depress anybody, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done, and Dave Mahardy is central to getting those things done, but he can't do everything himself, so we're going to need help. You know, I'm ready to pitch in. Um, we're going to expand the courtyard a little bit. and I mean, there's so many things that we're going to do, and I just love the, 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 you know, I know that the renovations maybe doesn't sound very spiritual, but I think that it's part of the environment, and it makes a difference when people see that beautiful wood fence. I mean, we made a lot of mistakes on that fence, okay? I, I would not buy green posts again, you know? And that green will disappear eventually, by the way, just so you know. But, you know, I, you know me, I'm colorblind, right? So I saw those posts, I was like, these are great, these are cheap. <laughs> and then later on, someone's like, they're green. I'm like, I had no idea. Like, <laughs> I wish people would tell them, like, the Home Depot guy should have told me, but he probably just thought I knew what I was doing. But, you know, but it looks great. I, I think, and uh, I love that it brings nature and, um, and uh, you know, the, the, so, you know, our building is very bricky and, and it's, it's, it's not very, there's not much nature, you know, and so bringing that wood in brings a nature feel, it brings a balance, bringing more flowers, plants, real, real plants, um, you know, but things like that. Anyway, I want to um, go on and on and on, but... Um, if, we'll see if, if headquarters does help us. It'll allow us to do the work a lot easier. If not, we're just going to get creative. Um, also, James Powell is coming back. 
Maybe some of you remember him. He, uh, he came like four years ago, uh, one of our, a new member from Wales. Uh, he joined our movement maybe 10 years ago. And he has crazy stories. So I've invited him to come, especially for our new members, because you know, I want to give them the opportunity to hear from their peers. But also, uh, for us too, it's wonderful. It's really re revitalizing, I think, to hear testimonies like his. And so he's going to be giving a workshop on May 31st. If that's a Saturday, that's the day. So I will remind you as we get closer to it. So planning to do a lot more with our new members. I talked with our, our, our spiritual growth class last week, and I said, hey, I, I think it'd be really important for us to go to a seven-day workshop in Las Vegas. So we're, we're going to try to do that. Maybe take a little road trip, maybe get a van, drive out there, have that experience, because I think it's really important. We've also talked about having more, like I said earlier, focusing more on God. What is God's words? What is God's desire for my life? It's nice that we all have opinions. But how many of our opinions are really based on what God's word tells us and how we should be living? I think in reality, a lot of our opinions are, are based on how we're already living our life. So, but we don't want to be that way. We want to have our opinions based off of God's word and re create myself as a person in God's image based on God's word. So we, we've been thinking, oh, what are some creative ways to do that? So we've talked about having a, a hundoke. Hundoke is a new word for you. It means it's just basically reading God's word. Evening, maybe once, huh? Potluck. Yes, hundoke potluck. We come and bring a dish. We sit down together. We read God's word together. We, we talk about it. What does this mean for my life? I don't understand this point. I don't believe this point. You know, all these different things. We can hash it out as a group. It'd be awesome. And get into some really great discussions about it. And then, um, you know, I don't know. Do some, we have to do something with the kids, so we have to figure that out. But uh, it could be just a really nice opportunity for our community to gather together and, and do something really meaningful in that way. And it maybe can help us jumpstart infusing that as a habit into our own lives if we're not already doing it. Also, I was really inspired by how in Ukraine, they're really close. They're really close-knit. It means they're really in each other's lives. They're really in each other's business. They don't hide details. And I love that. And I think that actually we want that for ourselves and our families. We want to feel close to, our, uh, to other families in our church. We want to feel close to other people in our lives. But it's not always easy to express that vulnerability. So doing it in a way that can be very productive and and um, meaningful is something that we're really committed to doing this year as well. And then lastly, because of, and not, not, you know, not even lastly, I mean, there's so many more things, but I also want to just point out that next year we're going to be officially establishing our, our burial site in this beautiful place that my dad found in, um, with a beautiful mountain view nearby Longmont. So we've, because of a generous donation by one of our families, um, they gave $2,000 so that we could create this park, this uh, cemetery bench, with a beautiful bench with like our logo and name and you know everything. And then we will have an opportunity to officially um, huh? dedicate that later this year. Also, the chapel. The reason why we're able to do the chapel, you may be wondering, oh, why do we need to do that while we're doing the the exterior renovation, all this stuff. Yeah, because I know it's kind of crazy, right? Uh, but that's just the way I am. Like, I don't, if I see something, I just kind of jump on it, and then I regret it later. But <laughs> we're never going to be able to make money with this room until we do the renovation. So it's like, it's a benefit for us, but also, like, it shortens the period of time before we can get that work done. But also, the main reason we're able to do it is because one of our families gave us $21,000. A year ago, this was actually a tithe on the sale of a property. And they, they gave that to us and they said, you know, please decide how you want to use this money. <laughs> so we've decided we want to use the money to do the, the chapel because um, good quality chairs, TVs, new wiring, all, it costs a lot of money. So I don't, yeah, and so I don't even know what it's going to cost yet. And we still have to design it and all this stuff, but you know, it's all because of the generous donation like that that we're able to do this. So I told them, like, this is what we're going to use it for, and they were really happy. So I was really grateful for that. So, um, so that's basically what I have to share today. Thank you for your patience. I know I went a little bit long. 
thank you so much for listening. And um, anyway, I just want to bring it back to the message because I know maybe you've all forgotten by now. But uh, focus, <laughs> focus on God, right? Focus on God. Live the way Jesus did. Live for God. That actually should, if done correctly, allow us to care for people better. It should allow us to care for nature better. It should allow me to love my wife, my children, my church family better. If not, then maybe there's something wrong there. But when we are loving God in a sincere way, centering our life on God in a real way, then I believe that's what should be happening. So please join me in prayer. Good morning, our most beloved Heavenly Parent. Thank you for today. Thank you for the opportunity to come together as a church family. Heavenly Parent, I pray that we can really inherit the heart of Jesus, especially at this time where we're celebrating Christmas, to really remember that Jesus lived his whole life for you. When, whether he was giving and loving people or whether he was being hung on the cross, he was doing it for you as a, as a filial son, as a good son, Heavenly Parent. And I pray that we can look at our own lives and ask myself, how am I living? Is, how is, what is my relationship with you? I pray, Heavenly Parent, that as a community, you can continue to guide us, as I really believe you are already, that we can live a life that really centers upon you and what is your will for this community, Heavenly Parent. I pray that we can always be humble to whatever your direction that you lead us in, to whatever, um, even if it's uh, corrections or changes that we need to make within ourselves, I pray that we can always be prepared for that, and that we can be your good object, that we can be your good sons and daughters who just want to in inspire you. We want to make you happy. We want to uh, relieve some of the burden that you have within yourself, Heavenly Parent, even though you are happy for us and you love us, and that's never going to change. But please allow us to grow up. Please allow us to see what can we return what can we give? What can we do for our heavenly parent, for you? How can we return some of the love that you have shown us? How can we do something that is going to make you relieve some of the burden off of your heart, heavenly parent? Let's do it as families. Let's do it as individuals. Let's do it as a community. We can really inherit the, the heart of your son, Jesus, and celebrate this season for what it truly is, and I really pray also that as we come to the new year, that we can offer up this year to you. There's uh, surely in all of our lives, there's been good things happening, um, things that we can be proud of and things that we can offer to you. We also have painful experiences and disappointments and, and things that maybe we are not so proud of. I, we, we pray that we can just offer those things to you and commit to have a new start in this new year and really dedicate ourselves to... Um, becoming new people and inspiring you and inspiring one another. I thank you and I offer this prayer in my name, Michael Adonia Hendrick, a blessed central family. Amen and adieu. Thank you.